Welcome to today's session in our Climate Talks Global Festival. Uh, my name is Matthew England. I'm a CNT professor of Ocean and Climate Dynamics at the University of New South Wales Climate Change Research Centre. Uh, my expertise is in the physics of the climate system and particularly the role of the oceans in climate. Um, I've worked on, the, worked on this topic for about 30 years now and so I'm one of the scientists who's been calling for action for longer than I wish to recall and I'm going to be moderating the discussion today. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm joining this discussion on Aboriginal land and that this land was never ceded, that it always was and always will be Abri Aboriginal land. And I pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, Islanders uh, elders past, present and emerging, and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining the audience today. Um, this event is hosted by the International Universities Climate Alliance. This is an alliance of 50 of the world's leading universities in climate change research. Our vision is to promote climate research and climate understanding with the aim of accelerating global climate action. Information about change, like information about climate Sorry. change. Joining this discussion on Aboriginal land. Pardon? I'm getting a bit of feedback. My mic. Um, information about climate change can be both complex and confronting. Scientists have tried to communicate this clearly and effectively for a long time now, but at the same time, climate misinformation has flourished and action has unfortunately lagged catastrophically relative to this urgency. The good news is that there are ways to challenge the perceptions and to confront this misinformation and this is exactly what we'll be discussing today with our three guest speakers. And I'll get to introducing them in a minute but first I just want to mention that you can ask questions if you click on the ask or ask a question button that's uh, located somewhere on your uh, team Windows team meeting there. And those questions will be collated and we'll get back to those questions during the discussion following the three presentations from the speakers. Um, so first up, I wish to uh, introduce Sarah, Dr. Sarah, um, Dr. Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick. Um, Sarah is a senior lecturer and an ARC future fellow in the School of Science at UNSW Canberra. Um, Sarah leads pioneering research into how to measure heat waves and how to measure their changes analyzing how heat waves will change under various scenarios of global warming, both in Australia and globally and into the future. Um, so clearly Sarah's at the forefront of looking at some of the threats that climate will pose to societies today and into the future. Um, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having me here. So um, Sarah, I should have been clear, sorry, I'm, I'm going to introduce each of you uh, sequentially. So sure. Okay, cool. That's the floor is too short. Sure. Like, yeah. Do I start on my rant already? Um, Thank you. So hi everyone, thanks for having me. It's great to be part of this really wonderful event. Um, I just thought I might talk to you a bit about science communication and especially around climate change. Um, that's also something that I do quite a lot of at the moment. Um, it's something that I'm also quite passionate about and something that I've built up um, perhaps over the last seven or eight years. Um, so a lot of the time, a lot of the time, I think most climate scientists don't actually feel like they're natural born communicators. And I was certainly one of them quite a number of years ago, but it was something that I was very interested in. Uh, climate science is obviously a very topical issue. It's very political, whether we like it or not, it, it is a political issue. So I kind of felt, you know, not that I was obligated to communicate about climate change, but it was, you know, something that could come part of the job. I understand, however, that not all climate scientists agree with that. A lot, a lot of our colleagues actually get into the industry because they're really interested in research. They're great, perhaps, computer programmers. They're great mathematicians or physical scientists. And com communication isn't for them. So I do want to say that perhaps not all climate scientists want to communicate, and I think that's perfectly fine. But I do think that many more of us can, and many more of us have, you know, I guess some sort of drive to actually do it. Um, you just might be a little bit scared of how to actually go about it. And I was certainly one of them, um, probably going back about nine or 10 years. So, you know, I guess why should we communicate? You know, firstly, it is a very important issue. It's, you know, arguably the biggest issue of our, you know, of the modern time. It is also very political, whether or not we like it to be. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's something that, you know, if, if you are comfortable doing that, you should perhaps try and pursue. It gives you, it gives you a good practice of being able to communicate your research, not just in a scientific way, um, but also, you know, in, in a more public and a more general way as well. Um, so I guess, you know, it does, you know, come down to personal choice if you do want to communicate. But I do think, you know, with, with greater support, more climate scientists can actually, you know, develop the communication skills. Now, coming from, you know, I come from a, I guess, working group one background, a physical science background, and it is a bit of a challenge. So to go from your sort of 
scientific jargon where you're talking about, you know, say, for example, in my, in my field, you know, climate models, physical observations, using jargon terms, lots of acronyms, it can be really hard to go from that to talking about, you know, what seems to be more basic science with, with, with more general people. And it's not something that comes easy, and it certainly didn't come easy for me for the, from the beginning. It takes a bit of practice. Actually, it probably takes a lot of practice. And I, I just want to kind of stress that you shouldn't be afraid to do that. So the biggest thing that I think helped me was um, taking a mixed approach. So, you know, obviously you have to talk about your research or climate science in general, but think about talking about it to, say, your friend or your parent or even a mix of these different people so you get an experience doing it for, for different audiences. And, yes, that is a challenge, but it's a good challenge and one that you can certainly perfect as time goes by. So, you know, you could first of all start practising when you have a friend over for dinner at your family barbecue over, I don't know, over a cup of coffee or, or, or at a night out or something like that. That really, I certainly started to do that and it really helped me hone in on my skills of what words to use and what words not to use and better phrases to use when I'm actually talking about my science. It's, you know, you don't have long to talk about science in the media. It's not like writing a journal article or giving a presentation at a scientific conference. You do have to hone in on specific things and you need to do it, you know, reasonably quickly. So it's always important that when you go into some sort of communication realm that you have, you know, clear talking points of what you want to talk about. So, for example, if I'm talking about heat waves and, you know, the topic is how have they changed, I'll go in with certain points about, you know, how heat waves have changed in Australia, what that might mean for health impacts um, and how that might look across different emission scenarios. And I stick to those three points in that in that specific setting. So it's really good to pre be prepared in that way and have your talking points clear. It really does help you stay on track during your conversation. Um, it's also really important to remember who your audience is, and I'll get back to this a bit. Um, I'm not actually sure, sure if my slide's up in a moment, but there's an important talking point there on my slide, which I'll, which I'll explain a bit later. Be familiar with your audience. So whether or not you're talking to a room full of school children, or if you're giving an international, giving a you know a live interview on international TV, you need to make sure that you are clear who your audience is, because you will tailor your conversation differently dependent on the audience. How I speak to school children is very different to how I speak uh, in a in a um, in a TV studio. I think you know something that I think a lot of people struggle with when communicating science to begin with is how actually you know to get that message across effectively, but more importantly, how to relate to your audience. And I do think, you know, this is something that climate scientists are getting better at, but I think there's also, you know, more room that we can improve with this. I think it's really important that we need to come across as human beings and as individuals and not just, you know, scientists that sit in our glass tower doing lots of different academic research that doesn't actually really seem relevant to the everyday person. I think we need to do better of that and communicate, you know, come, I wouldn't say, um, you know, come down to the audience's level, but be able to relate to them. That's probably the most important part. And a tactic that I've started to use a lot of lately is, you know, being, you know, a relatively young person, but also being a mother of two kids. And I think that helps me break the ice with an audience um, and help them see that I'm actually, you know, like them. I can relate to them. I'm still a human being. I still have everyday um, objectives and, you know, I still pay my taxes and, you know, li live a very normal life. Um, so I, I think that helps and also using different analogies to explain, explain different things. Uh, that's again a tactic that I use quite regularly that, you know, you don't just stick to the basic science, but you also use some sort of simile or metaphor to, to get that message across. It's a really important communication tool. We use them so much in everyday language that's actually, you know, another way of kind of getting the message across. Um, so I, yeah, I'm assuming that my slide might be up now. So I might just talk to some of the different visuals that I've got here. Um, and this is actually quite out of my comfort zone. Usually when I give a presentation, I have lots of different talking points off and, and not not pictures, but I think this, this kind of brings in my point a bit more clearly. So on the right there, I have two different images, one of which looks like a big brown thing, and, a, and this one underneath it is um, an image of, of some roofs. Now, here I want to make the point that try and use different um, mediums when you're presenting your information and give it a red hot go of using different tools. So that, that top right image is actually a 3D printer, a 3D printed version of how heat, the, the evolution of heat waves over the Sydney Basin here in Australia. 
And you can see it doesn't look like much, but when I, you know, when you explain that, you're like, oh, you can see how heat waves have changed in, in a 3D way. And I, at first I thought, you know, mixing art with science wasn't a great way to do it. But once I showed my husband this, this, this picture, he went, oh, I get it now. I get what you do. I can see how heat waves have changed and I can see it's important. So using different tactics of communication can actually help get your message across. Don't always think that how you understand the science is going to be a way to get that message across to, to other people. We all think differently. And that's, you know, that, that's kind of honed in again with this image of the hot roofs. This was a picture taken from Sydney during a massive heat wave we had. Um, and the different, you know, the, the, the more red the roof, the hotter it is. And again, this was another picture that I showed my husband. He's like, oh, that's really bad. When we have a heat wave in Sydney, it really does get hot in these Sydney houses. So these sorts of different visual ways to communicate what you, the message you're trying to get across can be really important for your audience. Now, I just wanted to get back to knowing your audience. Um, and that top, that top left picture is, is what I'm getting at there. This was an interview I did a number of years ago now for an international TV network called CNBC. When they approached me, I didn't realise who they were. I thought there was some sort of little radio network for, in, in a different country. I actually didn't do my research. And I, when I gave that presentation, it was frightening. It's probably the most frightening media interview I have ever done in my entire life. I somehow survived. I came through unscathed. I haven't watched it and I don't think I ever will, but it really scared me to know your audience. And I can't, I can't stress that enough, that when you're doing science communication, do your research. It may only be five minutes worth of research, but just know who you're speaking to because it may just, you know, it may not damage your communication career. Um, and the, there's a picture there of, of my, me and my, um, my first child. And I guess this is, you know, saying that I've used this in the media quite a lot, that it does help break the ice, that I am a human being too. I'm not a boffin. I'm a scientist, but I am also a family person and a, and a normal human being contributing to this society. And lastly, just the, just the pictures I have in the middle. These are different ways I now communicate cl climate science. So I've done blogs. I write for The Conversation. I've even actually started to work with News Corp publications here in Australia, which I never thought I'd ever do. So what I'm getting at here is as you hone in on your skills, diversify where you can and don't always think that, you know, sources that you may not have communicated with in the past will always be that way. So sure, yes, you need to learn different skills and, you know, perfect these as you go on, but you can always broaden your horizons as, as you become a communicator yourself. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll leave that there um, and hand it back over to Matt. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sarah. That was really good. I enjoyed hearing all of your takes on the challenges we face. Um, Sarah and I were at the same centre before Sarah moved to UNSW Canberra. Uh, that was great. Now, next up, we have Professor Ben Newell. Um, Ben's Deputy Head at the School of Psychology at UNSW Sydney. And, and Ben specialises in cognitive psychology. And so his research focuses on the cognitive processes underlying judgement, choice and decision making and the application of this knowledge to environmental medical, financial, and, for, and forensic contexts. Um, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Matt, and thanks everyone for joining this uh, really interesting discussion. I'm very glad to be part of it. So as um, Matt says, my background is in experimental psychology, focusing on judgment and decision making. And I first got interested in the application of that science to climate change communication through uh, discussions with one of Matt and Sarah's colleagues, Professor Andy Pittman, uh, who's also at UNSW, and he and I started by by him sort of his, his expressing his frustration, similar to Matt at the start of this session, that he could see what, where the science was heading, and he was getting frustrated about not being able to communicate that to other people. And so, at the time, I thought, well, as Sarah said, you know, we do all think differently, but we do also there are also commonalities in the way that we think. And, and part of the, the research that I do as a, as a cognitive psychologist is to, is to try and work out, well, what are some of those commonalities? What are some of those things that we think we know about how people think, how they process information, and how can that help us uh, to, to get communication across? And more importantly, picking up on the, the main topic of you know, countering misinformation, what is it about the way that we think and the, the structure of of our thoughts, if you like, um, that make us sometimes susceptible to this kind of uh, this kind of misinformation. So, really, all I wanted to do in, in the session, in my little piece here, is just to, to 
to highlight a few of those things that we think we know about how we think, uh, what the psychology of, of, of judgment, decision making, memory, all of those things um, we can tell us, and then and then how that what what that means for ways of, of improving our communication or countering our misinformation. And so I think the, the first sort of general point I want to make, and this goes back you know, research decades old, is that although we often like to think about um, kind of computers as a metaphor for the way that the brain works, the brain doesn't really work like that. The brain doesn't have a, a veridical storage of, of information. Our, our memory doesn't work as a kind of camera that takes a picture and that we can go and access exactly the same information that we saw. Memory works in a very constructive or reconstructive way. And so when we're trying to um, perhaps form an opinion about something as, as amorphous and complex as climate change, we are going into uh, a situation where we're trying to access lots of different bits of information. Some bits of information are going to be more salient, more available, more perhaps emotionally laden than others. And we try to put those together in a, in a kind of coherent narrative. So one of the most, um, I guess, influential ways of, of thinking about how people um, make coherent accounts of the information that's in front of them uh, is called the story model. And it's a model that was developed actually in thinking about how people reach conclusions in, uh, in legal cases. But, but it's essentially saying that people piece together these different facts piece together the different bits of information they have, try to make them into a, co a coherent whole that they can then draw conclusions on. And if we think about that in the context of the information that we get about climate change, then each of those different facts that we get, we're trying to build into our own coherent narrative, our own coherent story. And depending on the, the way that we approach that information or the, the sources that we get or our knowledge about the different sources that we're getting the information from, that story that we create, that narrative that we create is going to be very different. And I think it, it's different from the way that the, the, the climate scientist sees it, it's different from the way the cognitive psychologist might see it, it's different from the way that, that the, the broader public, because of the way that our brain works, because of the way that we think, all of these different facts get, get weighted differently. And so I think when it comes to the challenge of, of, of how to communicate, Sarah's right in that we have to think of lots of different channels for communication. We have to think of the fact that people come to this situation with very different worldviews. Telling showing someone a graph with sea level rise on it when they can look outside their window and say, well, the sea looks like it's at the same level as it was 10 years ago, uh, is a challenge. We might react to that and say, yeah, but you're not thinking about it in the right way. That's not, the, that's not the way it works. That's not the data. But if it's the way it works in their head, if it's the way that you're constructing your understanding of what it means for a climate to change or the weather to change, then of course you're going to meet that, that sort of resistance. And so I think what, what has to happen is that you need to, um, you need to tailor the message. You need to think about the, the way that, 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 that things work. You, you need to realize that for you, a set of numbers that are you know, mathematically equivalent are, are not necessarily psychologically equivalent. So that saying that there's a 80% probability and that something happens eight out of 10 times is mathematically equivalent, but it doesn't convey the same message psychologically. The eight out of 10 can have, you know, especially if you then link it to you know, eight people that, whose houses are gonna go under as a function of sea level, um, rather than thinking of it as an abstract probability, that has a different impact on the stories that people then, then construct. So I think it's, it's dangerous sometimes to, to think of people trying to understand this science as, as either um, hopelessly you know, biased or irrational. We hear a lot in judgment and decision making about the biases that people have and how they're irrational and how they don't understand things. And I think that's too negative a view. I think people are actually very astute often at using lots of different sources of information, constructing their, their, their narrative, their story. Um, but they're perhaps less sensitive to, to where some, sometimes where this information is coming from, to whether the sources that they have of that information is, is correct or not. And also that their, that their 
worldview, the, the model that they're trying to fit it into can be um, very different from our own. And that, that creates a, a, a sort of tension between the understanding that, that we're trying to impart or that we're trying to, to get them to think about. Um, and so I think that just having that uh, awareness that, that memory is constructed, that information that, that seems equivalent has different properties because of the, the emotional tags it might have, or the salience it might have, or the ease with which people can recall different facts, or the way that they're basically trying to build in what you're telling them with what they can see and what they understand about the world around them. And I think having all of those pieces together um, really can help us build not just knowing your audience, but knowing how your audience works and, and you know, how, their, how their cognitive machinery works to come up with the, the opinions and the judgments that they form. And I think that, that's basically the main point I, I want to say, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that that can then lead into some discussion and some questions later. So I'll hand, that, hand that back to you, Matt. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, yeah, when, when you were speaking just then, it made me realise, you know, as scientists, we live and breathe our, our, our lens, our, our view of climate change is through graphs and numbers. And, and, you know, we might hold up a graph and think everybody should have the same reaction as us. But of course, um, if, you're not, if you're not looking at our data every day and, and your, your, your lens is, you know, how, how your weather is that day or whatever it is, it's such a, such a different um, communication challenge. Well, thanks, Ben. I'm enjoying seeing the questions come through. I um, appreciate that. Just a reminder, you can click and, and ask away now or, or leave it for, um, we've got plenty coming through, So, um, but add to them if you feel like it. And just last last of our presenters and, and panellists, once we go to Q&A, is Dr. John Cook. Um, John's a postdoctoral research fellow with the Climate Change Communication Research Hub at Monash University. John's research focuses on using critical thinking to build resilience against misinformation. Um, John's also the founder of the Skeptical Science website, which is a a, a, a tool to, devoted to a website devoted to debunking climate change myths and mistruths. Um, thanks, John. Thanks, Matt. Um, really enjoyed Sarah and Ben's talks too. Um, hard act to follow, but also a pleasure to follow on from what you were talking about. Uh, and I wanted to kind of follow on exactly um, really smoothly from Ben's points. He was uh, talking about how we think uh, and how we think about how we think. Uh, and I wanted to kind of just sort of narrow the focus uh, more specifically on how we respond to information and messages. Uh, and one of the challenges there is that messages can be persuasive regardless of the quality of the information. Um, how, how, I guess, influenced we are by messages, uh, we take a lot of different cues uh, that, that uh, lead to them being persuasive. And, and I think um, Ben hinted at a few of those. He mentioned how uh, easy information was to process. When thoughts or ideas flow smoothly, people are, are more likely to agree with them um, without um, critically analyzing them. Uh, and that can be things even as basic as like the color we choose when we're, cho we're choosing our fonts or the typeface we use, the easier they are to read, the more persuasive they are. It's, it's things as basic as that. Uh, and also messages that are more familiar. Uh, pe people find them easier to read, um, easier to understand and remember. And so if uh, messages, whether they're accurate information or misinformation, get repeated over and over and people, people see them repeatedly, that makes them more uh, credible in people's eyes at a subconscious level. Uh, and the last thing, um, is a thing that psychologists call the availability heuristic, uh, which is uh, we tend to uh, rely on whatever information we just pull, pull to mind, whatever's the most immediately available. Uh, and sometimes that can just be something that is some message or image or, or fact or you know supposed fact that's vivid and memorable, something shocking or, or that gets an emotional response. That can be the um, most available information that, that people can recall when they're trying to make decisions on whether to believe a message or not. Uh, and so all these, all these little uh, cues that people take on whether to believe something or not uh, don't necessarily have anything to do with the quality of the actual information and whether it's factual or not. And that makes us vulnerable to being persuaded by misinformation. Uh, it means that 
potentially misinformation can spread like a virus uh, and spread from person to person. And the more virulent misinformation is, uh, the more the chances that it can go viral and, and spread even faster. Uh, and one other challenge of misinformation is, and I think that's particularly relevant to a, a panel about climate communication and involving lots of scientists, is that misinformation can cancel out uh, accurate information. In other words, when people are presented with facts and myths, uh, and they don't have any way to resolve the conflict between the two, then the danger is the myth can cancel out the facts and people just disengage and believe neither. Uh, and that has big consequences for anyone who's involved with uh, climate communication or engaging with the public or education. Uh, it means that just communicating the facts while necessary can be insufficient because our climate communication or our science communication can potentially be undone or undermined by misinformation. It means that uh, not only do we need to communicate our facts, we also need to protect them uh, in some way as we send them out into the world. Uh, and fortunately, the way that we can do that and the way we can stop misinformation from spreading like a virus is the same way that we stop a virus from spreading through inoculation. Um, there's Inoculation is a topic that we are all very uh, familiar with at the moment. The country has been obsessed with it for the last 12 months. So I don't really need to explain too much about that other than just to um, explain that in psychological research, um, we've been taking the idea of vaccination and applying it to knowledge. We found that when you expose people to a weakened form of misinformation that builds up their immunity, so that when they encounter the actual misinformation, they're less likely to be misled. And um, most inoculation, most um, fact checking uh, tends to be fact based, uh, by which I mean um, we tend to try to inoculate people against misinformation by explaining the facts to them. Uh, here is a myth, but here are the facts that show how that myth is wrong. Uh, but another powerful way of neutralizing misinformation is what we call, we being psychology nerds, um, is what we call uh, logic-based inoculation. Um, and this basically means explaining the techniques used to mislead. What are the rhetorical techniques? What are the logical fallacies that are used to, to mislead and deceive people? If you can um, uh, explain these techniques to people, raise their awareness, of the techniques used to mislead, that makes them more immune to being taken in by those techniques. And the power of this logic-based approach is, A, it works across the political spectrum. Uh, everyone, whether you're at the left or the right end of the political spectrum, doesn't like being misled. So explaining the techniques used to mislead um, can, can neutralize that misinformation um, regardless of where they sit on the political spectrum. And secondly, uh, this approach, this logic-based approach can work across topics. Uh, what I found was when I uh, explained a technique used in tobacco misinformation, which the tobacco industry used to cast doubt on the link between smoking and cancer, that uh, inoculation also built immunity against the same technique used in climate misinformation. So I was able to actually inoculate people against a climate myth without even mentioning the myth, but just explaining that technique in general. Um, I've got a couple more minutes, right, Matt? So, Correct. Right, so, uh, Correct. Yeah, uh, go for it. The, there is a challenge, though, with, with this approach in trying to inoculate the public. Well, there's three challenges I found. Uh, it's something I've been struggling with in my own research. The first challenge is psychological. Logic-based inoculation is basically like building people's critical thinking skills. Uh, and the problem with that is um, critical thinking is hard. Our brains are hardwired for uh, mostly fast, instant reactions. We make gut reactions to, or, or heuristics. We rely on heuristics to, um, to, to guide our thoughts and, and how we respond to, or to any messages and information. Uh, and so 
uh, encouraging people to um, engage in like slow thinking or system two thinking or critical thinking is is difficult. The second challenge is social. Um, more and more, we're seeing that our society is being um, uh, sil becoming siloed and, and people are getting their information from echo chambers. So trying to get our, our messages into these echo chambers or our inoculations into these echo chambers, particularly communities that are targeted or vulnerable to misinformation is a big challenge. And thirdly, uh, climate change has become more and more polarized over time, um, which is another way of saying it's become tribal. Uh, people tend to follow what their own social group um, believes. Uh, and so when, when you're communicating messages that go against what their tribe believes, they're more resistant to it. Uh, so these three challenges, psychological, social, and cultural or tribal, uh, are, are genuine challenges for uh, climate communicators and, and anyone trying to inoculate against misinformation. And the last thing I'll say is um, one thing, I, just this is kind of a gratuitous plug for the work that we're doing, uh, is we've, we've been exploring one elegant way to tackle all three challenges at once, once which is using games. Games get people practicing critical thinking, um, which can help overcome that psychological challenge. The more you practice, the more difficult task becomes quicker and easier. Uh, games in the classroom are a really powerful way to reach a broad population um, and potentially pierce through those echo chambers. And games can also harness our tribal instincts for good rather than for negative impacts. Uh, so if you could get people playing against each other, they um, they could potentially want to learn critical thinking so that they can beat the other team uh, and and that tribal instinct can motivate people to build up their own resilience against misinformation. Uh, so, um, the, yeah, the game we're testing at the moment is prankinguncle.com, uh, which uh, inoculates players against misinformation about climate change and, and misinformation across a range of scientific topics. Uh, I might uh, leave it there and happy to answer any questions during the Q&A. Thanks, John, um, and thanks to all the three speakers. I found it fascinating to listen to each of you with your um, perspectives. And, and I've spoken with each of you too about some of these topics before, uh, and, and so much has been brought up, and, and I can see a whole stream of questions that I'm going to be trying to get through. Um, but I'm going to start off just coming back to you, John. You've just spoken. I just one of the questions that came up is, um, you know, how do you, uh, you know, what, how, how do you um, summarize all? The, not summarize, but yeah, the, the techniques to misinform. You know, we've got these brilliant orators. Some of these champions of misinformation are brilliant orators. And, and we know that debates don't work. Be, uh, you know, as you said before, two voices can cancel each other out to neutrality or to people thinking this is this is a debate. It's not not certainty. So so how do you you know, how do you um, uh, counter that that sort of challenge of somebody who's a superb orator? Sounds like they know what they're talking about. Um, and, and, you know, other examples of techniques that this misinformation uh, comes it comes in and, and how we can counter those as scientists. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really challenging situation. Um, a, a good orator is kind of like a skillful magician. Uh, and so the way you um, you neutralize them is you expose their sleight of hand magic tricks, their magic techniques. Once people see that technique, they can't unsee it. Uh, and so you can use their misinformation as a... Um, as a teachable moment, as a as an educational opportunity to not only explain the facts but also explain the techniques that misinformation uses to distort the facts. Take take a if there's a good orator usually can express their argument in a really concise way, but then they're usually the ones that you can take an example from their their misinformation, and it's a, often it is a really pristine exemplar that you can use to demonstrate here is how people misinform here's what they said here is the fact but here is the technique that they use to distort the facts um, I, I, I love that i love that analogy of the magician because you're right that once you expose the sleight of hand it's it's it, you can't not see that right you, you you it's just there um that's a really nice example and sarah just quickly to you i mean in terms of misinformation as a scientist you, you know you go give a talk and same thing can come your way i mean 
there's a bit of a question around about you know how do you manage that misinformation and communicating to others. Um, we don't necessarily expose magicians as well as as well as we'd like to. But what what do you do in that situation? Yeah, so I've not had it happen, you know, in a huge public forum. You know, if I've done a lot of media in, in, in TV, it's not an immediate feedback. But certainly on one-to-one -one conversations or in smaller groups, it has happened. And something that I've found that works, what usually happens when people, you know, are coming to you with misinformation is boom, 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 boom. They want to bombard you with everything they happen to know or, you know, all their knowledge on this misinformation. And if I kind of, I've noticed that if I kind of like, recede a bit and say yes I understand I acknowledge you know I can see where you're coming from or words around that they tend to back off a bit they're not as you know angry or they don't want to take you down as much or you know throw all this inf misinformation in your face yeah. um and I think that's you know that that's a good disarming tactic I think is the best way to describe it and then casually you know I might start to talk about well have you looked at this, where these sources of information are coming from? You know, is it coming from a, you know, is it being supported by a coal mining industry? Let's evaluate whether or not you think that's a, you know, objective source or a certain media corporation or something yeah. like that. So I think breaking the ice and kind of saying that, you know, yes, you, you kind of understand where they're coming from, but then working through yeah. the issue with them has certainly helped. That's a that's a really nice example. That sort of uh, giving oxygen to what they've just said. I mean, if you go straight for the for the rebuttal, the denial, the confrontation of that, um, if in fact you alienate them, I assume. And I, I remember I Steve yeah. Steve Schneider, um, who who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, was brilliant at that. He would always say to the speaker, no matter how aggressive, look, this is a really good question. I'm, I'm glad you're thinking about this. And it was yeah. a beautiful way to draw in not just the the questioner but also the audience to thinking about. Uh, what Steve was going to say, so it's a really nice example. Um, ben, there is a question here that I that's got tagged to you, and I really like it because it says that it, the question is how do you assess when someone's open to accurate information? And so the other way to put it is how do you recognise when you're basically wasting your time? And I think the idea here is some people are are have got a conviction, and the more you speak with them about the alternate view, they're just going to harden. So so how do we know that? How do we know when somebody's no longer um, open to new new th new thinking i guess i guess one way would be if they repeatedly failed john's game that they just can't figure out how to uh how to spot logical fallacies and so on but i guess a, a, a related answer would be that i, I think the people who and, and this you know we can talk about this in terms of climate science also the, the sort of vaccination issue that's very prominent at the moment but that the proportion of people who are really kind of rusted on out and out deniers of climate science or, or you know, are, are really the contrarians are a very loud but very small minority. Mm. And so I think that if, if we are thinking about is it is it worth trying to engage or how much effort should we be putting into trying to change the minds of those people versus People for whom, and I think you, you know, the response that you just had in the previous question about not wanting to be confrontational, not wanting to to put people offside, because there's genuinely, as, you know, as I was saying, I think we don't want to dismiss people as being unthinking and biased and, and irrational. People are trying to understand the problem, and often with, with the climate change debate now, it's not so much, you know, is it is it happening or not? It's what can I what what can I actually do? To, to, to help here, what, how can I change? And I think trying to, to get at those people, the, 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 the more middle of the spectrum, rather than worrying about the people that are just you know, rusted on contrarians and whatever you, whatever you say, it's going to, they, they're going to hear the complete opposite or they're going to say the complete opposite. And, and it's that, that sort of in descent into conspiratorial thinking where every new fact that I give you or, or attempt to rebut the argument that you're putting, you weave it into the, the ever growing conspiracy um, theory that you have and it just becomes even more sort of uh, un unwieldy as you as you build in these nonsense. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good point, Ben. And I think it's great that we've probably got to that stage now where the actual physics of climate change, the physics of greenhouse gases, I mean, we've not, we've, this is established science over the last couple of hundred years. You know, it goes yeah. back to people understanding atmospheric radiation and 
Uh, it, it's good that we've finally got there. It's probably taken 30 years longer than most of us would have liked it, but that basic physics of the problem, yeah, sure. greenhouse, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, ongoing greenhouse gas emissions will warm the planet catastrophically, and it's going to cost us big time and much bigger than it would to solve the problem. And, and so we've got a couple of questions on that issue. So, you know, the science is settled. We know we need to act on it, um, but, but we now have misinformation about the solution. So, I mean, I'm opening to any of the three panelists here. If you want to talk a bit about, you know, what are we now confronting in terms of climate miscommunication, climate misinformation in relation to how hard this problem is to solve? So, we, um, I am, um, this is a very exciting milestone for any scientist, but I just got a email from a journal that a, a paper just got approved this afternoon. And, and it's a paper where we look at this exact question. We've um, basically done machine learning research to build a history of 20 years of climate misinformation. And what we find is misinformation about climate solutions is just becoming a bigger and bigger portion of the misinformation pie. So solutions misinformation is the future of climate misinformation, and it's if not already there. And within that um, category of climate misinformation, the biggest category is arguing that climate policies will be harmful, that they will um, raise prices, hurt the economy. Um, this is probably, the I think, the second most common subcategory was that renewables uh, won't work. So it's really about uh, attacking policy and attacking renewables. Um, but the, ultimately, the, the, the conclusion from any of these arguments is Therefore, we should delay climate action. It's always about delay, but there's a number of different um, arguments used to support that conclusion. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's um, it it's good to see that we've moved on. It's bad to see that there's a whole new fertile ground that's opened up because I think this. Um, I, I remember years ago um, when it must have been before Copenhagen and we did a big push to communicate the latest science and the co and I was I was in the media talking about you know the risk the risks of inaction and and you know I, I probably did the thing I think Sarah referred to in her presentation you know as scientists we sort of live and breathe uncertainty sometimes so I probably over, over you know overly nuanced the statements I remember a climate a, a coal spokesman came out and said if we if we act on climate the mining industry in Australia is gone and and actually it's quite the opposite in renewables there's a huge need for, for many precious metals and, and the mining industry will actually be fine in a, in a future world of renewable heavy um, solar panels, for example, need a lot of um, metals and so on. So we're not, we're not digging up coal, we'll be digging up other stuff. And so this misinformation was so confronting to me. It was so clear. They just came and said with certainty that the, you know, the, the mining sector will fall apart. And so uh, the conviction that some of these speakers have is, is confronting. But I think there's a really good point you made is that um, the solutions that we have are actually, you know, they're, they're economy growers, you know, to move to renewables, um, they're going to they're gonna grow the economy. And I, I know Nick Stern and, and Ross Garneau both had really comprehensive reports out on, on the costs of, of action being so much cheaper than the costs of inaction. Um, uh, ben and, and Sarah, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this idea of, you know, when we have, you know, how, what are the challenges with communicating that the solutions aren't as scary as some people um, would have us think? So I, I think a lot of the time it seems like the responsibility feels on, falls on us as, as a climate scientist, for example, to have the solutions ready to go. And yes, I know a bit about them, but I'm not, you know, well versed in all sort, all forms of green energy and, you know, the current technology, for example. But something that I have found that people tend to think you're going to take away our jobs, it's going to be immediate, we're going to not have any power, it's going to be Armageddon. And I think, you know, again, acknowledging, well, this is going to take time. We know it's going to take time. We know there needs to be a transition. And, you know, with due respect, this is why we were talking about this 30 odd years ago. I think, you know, acknowledging that we are aware that this is not something that can happen overnight and it's something that we want to work with you. And also, you know, it's not, you know, don't shoot the messenger. We're here to help. We're not here to um, make sure you're out of work because that's far from it. We want to help you transition as well as transitioning towards, you know, a, a greener society effectively. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I've had that same problem as a scientist. You know, you, you, you give a diagnosis in a, in a, like, I mean, in a way where, where the experts spelling out the problems of doing nothing. And then, of course, if you end a talk with that, it's, it's also a bit depressing and, and, and it's a bad note to end on. But, and so I've, I've tried to cobble together that knowledge as well. And I'm still completely, um, 
reliant on the experts in that area, and I do I do read their their statements to, to understand the solutions are there and and, and are, are there to be embraced, and and that jobs uh, are are needed. I mean, jobs will open up in in those sectors. Um, ben, what what do you have to say in that in that topic area? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a fascinating um, shift in the in the, you know where the debate is lying, and I think another part of the the delay tactic that that works in terms of another aspect of the delay that John's talking about, and you know talking about the technologies that aren't going to be able to work and or aren't going to be good enough, and so we need to stop. The other part of it is the is fueling the idea that that, that we can't do anything about it, and whether that's at an individual level or a, or at a collective societal level, and you see this rhetoric, you know. The, the kind of drop in the bucket, why should I change my behavior because what I do doesn't make any difference, then goes up to the national level of, well, you know, we're only a small emitter, so we don't need to do anything. And I think the the misinformation around the solutions reinforces that inertia for, for behavior change. And I think that's, that's a really important part of um, where the communication needs to go as well. And I think that, that part of that, some of the work that I've been doing recently, looking at not just kind of behavioral techniques to, to encourage people to, to make the right choice or do the more environmental thing, but also just the kind of moral arguments and, and emphasizing that this is a problem that is that we're all in together and that there is a, a sort of moral compunction that if we realize that actions that we're taking at the moment are, are contributing to a harm, either now or, or in the, the future generations, then there's a, there's a moral reason for us to, to stop doing that, to change, change that behavior. But I think getting that, to getting that balance between the individual and the collective is also really important, that we don't just put all the, all the weight back on individuals to reduce their carbon footprint when it's in fact you know, the, the corporations and the governments that can have the biggest influence there. But, but, but to get movement on one, you need to have movement on the other. That, that carbon footprint term I, I read recently, it was actually, you know, the coin, the term was coined by a fossil fuel that's right, company yeah. executive. And I, I mean, that, that's confronting to me. It's such a, you know, we, this, this term's been going on for so long and a lot of people are mindful of it, um, people who want to make a difference. And, and again, you get that question at the end of talks, you know, what can I do as an individual? And yeah. I, I started saying I'll just vote for the right party, but it's not yeah. really, in a way, I think... Um, it is important for people to feel empowered as well, and I think um, I agree with you. We can't solve this by everybody who knows it's a problem doing their bit. Um, we need more than that. We need, you know, business and government incentives to to drive the change. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a tough one. Of course, there's the other end of the spectrum where people give up and kind of feel like, well, we're not going to get there. Um, yeah. You know, they they'll hear us saying we've been talking about this for 30 years. The window of our emissions that we've got remaining to avoid breaching Paris is confrontingly um, tight. It's, it, it's really confronting. And, and so what do we say to people who kind of think that's it, we've lost this battle? They almost see it as a, as a binary outcome. We're either going to solve it or not. H how do we deal with that? Giving people hope, giving people a sense that there's um, something that can be done. So I think... Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, I was just, like, this is something that I've really, I've been asked a lot about, but something I'm, you know, quite quite passionate about, that we do need to give people hope. I get asked a lot, how do you do your job? It's so depressing. How can you sleep at night? But I, I constantly have hope. I constantly have hope that things won't be as bad as the worst climate projection that we currently have. I, I am, you know, very hopeful, and I do believe that at some point we will make drastic change to make sure we don't warm by catastrophic amounts. Will we reach or, you know, stabilise at 1.5 or 2 degrees warming? Probably not. However, I don't think we will reach, you know, the 5, 6, 7, 8 degree warming. And I think saying that we have hope and it's 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 up to us to make these changes and not just make everyday changes, not just vote, but campaign for changes as well and put pressure on political parties, whoever's in power at the, at the time, to do better. Um, so, you know, if we have hope, if we're the people that are leading the science and, you know, in some ways leading the, the, the public discussion, if we have hope, I think that gives other people in the more general sphere hope too, that we're not just here, you know, giving our doom and gloom message and then walking away. You know, we're, we're in it for the long haul and we're, we're in it to see change happen. And I think that's very important. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I, I, the other thing that I think of is, um, you know, in terms of the change, you know, every 
tenth of a degree. We often talk about 1.5 or 2, and then it's all going to be bad. And yet, you know, 2.2 would be a big success. And, 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 and then 2.5 is much worse than that. And each fraction of a degree, you know, stacks the odds for, for the very costly rates of sea level rise and heat waves and bushfire seasons and so on, higher and higher. But um, it, it, it's, it's a really important message to, to have out there that, that every single fraction of a degree um, that we can, every, and every ton of, of carbon that we can stop emitting um, will we, we'll, we'll limit that future climate change. Um, I want to talk quickly about, we've only got about 10 more minutes to go. I'm just keeping track of questions on the right uh, here, um, as well as other things that have come up. Just quickly, one of the things that occurred to me some years ago is, is what I call surprising voices. And, um, you know, we hear from scientists all the time about this problem. And one of the things I've found very effective at times, and, and we can't really um, uh, contrive this, it really just comes out of, you know, you'll, you'll hear a, f a former fossil fuel executive come out and talk about the problem. So wh why do we, why are those voices so important, those voices that we're not expecting to hear from? The National Party MP, for example, uh, who recently spoke about virtually disowning the party if they weren't going to act on climate change. Does somebody want to talk a bit about those surprising voices? Why do they trigger uh, a response in us? I, I can give a very sort of generic or broader, broad attempt to answer that one. I mean, along the lines of what I was saying about people, you know, trying to act as uh, building a narrative or, or a term that I've used in recent work is to think about people as actually acting like scientists, intuitive scientists, like trying to understand the world around them by creating the best explanations that they can for what they're confronting. One of the things we know from decades of work on, on learning is that a, a good signal of when we learn something or when something will, when we acquire a new bit of knowledge is to do with, with what we call a, a prediction error. So it's basically the difference between what we're expecting and then what we actually find out. So if, if I'm learning about what foods maybe give me allergies versus don't give me allergies, and I have some pre preconception about what those things are, but then I eat something and suddenly I have a reaction that I wasn't expecting. The prediction error is the difference between my expectation of what would happen when I ate that food and what actually happened. So if you, if you allow me to stretch the analogy far enough, when I hear the coal executive uh, say, oh, we should stop burning fossil fuels, there's a massive prediction error there because I was expecting him to say exactly the opposite thing. Right. But he came out and said, no, no, we should stop doing it. So that becomes then a, a, a very salient, for want of a better word, thing that I might learn. It might then be brought, in, and it might cause a change in my in the in the narrative or the story that I've that I've been constructing about what I think climate change is and what I think it means to to um, to act on it. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, Sarah or John, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, so, from a practical science communication point of view, uh, a book that I often recommend for anyone doing science communication is Made to Stick by the Heath Brothers, and they they have an acronym for sticky messages. Um, like these are the things you want to try to incorporate in your sticky messages if you want to grab people's attention uh, and have your messages remembered. Uh, and the acronym is SUCCESS, standing for simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional, and story. A lot of these things have been brought up earlier in today's discussion, but unexpected is one of them. When you take people by surprise, they're more likely to remember it, more likely to share it. Uh, and so that's one of the key elements of, of sticky messages. So when I talk to scientists, uh, and this is kind of, kind of wandering from your question a little bit, but often we're trying to communicate uh, counterintuitive concepts, and, and I recommend lean into that and use that to, make, uh, to surprise people, to make your yeah. science stickier. Yeah, nice. Um, we are getting towards the end of our hour. I just want to um, come on to a slightly different topic. Uh, there's been a question posed. I think it's, it's, it could be applied to companies as well. Um, you know, governments can, can, do, uh, can undertake campaigns all the time to convince, uh, you know, apparently the Australian government's launched a bit of a campaign and they've been long doing this in a way that, that, that they're doing enough on climate change or on, on securing a safe climate future. And, and how do we deal with that level of kind of more organized misinformation? It's well funded. Um, the lovely ad that shows, you know, trees and uh, kids running through a park and everything looks beautiful and well and that we're okay, we're going to solve this problem. 
um, you know, from a from a comms perspective, um, how do we? And also, of course, companies. A lot of companies are talking about, you know, oh, we'll be net zero by twenty fifty, and and you want to dig into the detail and, and find out more about that before, you know, knowing that's a, a genuine a genuine commitment. So, so do you have any comments on this issue um, of sort of that level of mis misinformation, where it comes down from you know organised PR campaigns and so on? And, and you know, as, as scientists, we don't we just publish our papers and write these very long IPCC reports. What are we what are we missing out on here? I would say like my first thought when I when I heard that question is when do we ever take anything at face value from the government? <laughs> you know, if it's whether or not it's a um, a campaign for the election or I don't know some other policy they want to sell, do we really trust it at face value? Um, maybe sometimes, you know, a small minority of times there is something in what they're trying to say. Um, but, you know, question the source, I think. Yeah. That's, it makes, that's a good point, Sarah. It makes me think of, of John's comment before about, um, you know, exposing the sleight of hand, expo exposing the trick. And I, I mean, we hope that the vigorous debates that happen in Parliament House, the, the opposition government, the opposition parties at the time, at whatever government level, um, ca can smell a rat, so to speak, and can, uh, can out any... Um, you know, glossy campaign that, that's 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 shielding the reality of a lack of action on a topic. So yeah, no good point, Sarah. Ben, I don't know if you have something to add to that um, that level of misinformation where it's institutional right up to the top levels of government. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it is it is difficult to to um, combat that kind of that kind of technique. But but I guess it's it's the same. You know the principles that they that, that are being used are the same ones that we understand about what makes messages sticky. You know, you can, you can use this these techniques from both sides, <laughs> and and the hope is that by making people aware of the kinds of um, techniques that are being used, the things that that we know are persuasive, and as John was talking about, make messages stick. Just giving people awareness of that, or challenging them, as Sarah's saying, challenging them on well, why do you think that message is being sent to you in that particular way what's this what's the source what's the underlying motive um to think critically about that is, is absolutely crucial thanks ben um we are coming up towards the end and i think uh, you know one of the things i reflect on uh, when i speak to to experts in the energy sector certainly is that um coal is losing all its legs it, it it's you know propped up by by government subsidies still and it's it's getting priced out by renewables and a combination of solar and and, and storage in this country and, and, and most parts around the world, you know, the energy costs are shifting so that we're going to solve this problem. Uh, and, and obviously, I think, um, you know, the next big step is, is, that, is that chain reaction where the finances that go to the fossil fuel sector really is going to collapse because um, there'll be a perception of risk. And that's already happening. You know, banks do not want money locked up in, in investment that's risky. And, and if you're proposing a new you know, source of fossil fuel energy, what could be riskier when the whole world's talking about going to net zero? Um, and, and so it's a, it's a hopeful um, point to end on. Um, we're certainly seeing change. We're, we're moving forward. Um, I really want to thank the three speakers here today, um, Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick, John Cook and, and Ben Newell. Um, great to chat with the three of you. And I also want to thank everybody who joined online. I enjoyed the questions. I know we didn't get through every single one of them, um, but I enjoyed ha having you in the webinar and, um, and discussing these really important topics. So thank you very much.